Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to our uh, virtual webinar and district live stream today. And thank you very much for joining us. My name is Cheryl Gulledge, and I am the manager of communications for the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District. Today, the district's top officials are joined by the province's chief medical officer of health to release the reopening plan for September 2020. Board Chair Gromway Price, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, and the district's director of education, Tony Stack, will each have some remarks before we open it up to questions from the media who have joined us today and have joined us earlier for a technical briefing. Each will be given um, equal opportunity um, and uh, we will uh, proceed with one question and one follow-up as we uh, complete the portion here, um, first off with some remarks from those assembled. To begin today's announcement, may I introduce Chair of the District's Board of Trustees joining us from Labrador, Gromway Price. Mr. Price, I hand things over to you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Good day, everybody, and thanks for being here. I also welcome Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to our table. Obviously, this is clearly a partnership for moving forward that we do need our professionals in health and our professionals in education to take care and make sure that our children are safe as we, as we do move forward. I also welcome those people that are uh, watching uh, the live broadcast on the NLESD's uh, YouTube channel. As Cheryl noted, I am Ronnie Price, the chair of the Board of Trustees of uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District, and I'm tying in from Happy Valley Goose Bay. One thing we've learned over the past several months is that this, is a, this can be a very effective way of communicating with our stakeholders through these uh, virtual mechanisms, and that's why we've chosen our uh, particular piece today. That's why we decided to hold an online release of the Newfoundland and Labrador English School District's operational plan for school reopening in September. And part of the reason for this is our province is a large piece of geography and we need to extend and reach out to all the communities and uh, provide access so everyone can have the comfort and the security and safety in our families to send our children back to school. So this is, this is a critical thing for us, both for the rural and the urban centers in our province. We will answer as many of the questions that we can based on the current information today with the professionals that we have available to us. The job the government has done at all levels over the past number of months has been absolutely significant and other jurisdictions would be, you know, are envious of the position that we are in because we've been able to do this job. But this job has enabled us to do one critical thing. It's enabled us to have the time to plan and do what we need to do to get schools ready and safe for our families and our children to go back. If we hadn't done, and the residents of our province hadn't committed to the health measures that we have committed to over the last number of months, we'd be reacting to circumstance rather than being able to implement a plan. And we, we, should, be, we should be thankful of that. That means that we still have a lot to do as we move forward to make sure that the thing works in the future. Since the release of the provincial government's uh, K-12 education reentry plan on July 6, and even before that, Board of Trustees and District staff have been consulting with government officials, the NLTA, the Special Interest Councils, principals, parent representatives through school councils and the Federation of School Councils, and students, even reaching out to the students, our primary stakeholders, to try and get feedback on what their concerns are and their, uh, their, their worries are about a safe reentry all in preparation for the release of our operational plan that we're doing today. There's two components of safely opening up schools uh, in September, and it's, it breaks down like this. In the pandemic and the COVID scenario, there's a lot of what's and why's that have to be answered as it relates to COVID and what we have to do safely. And that falls within the professional realm of healthcare. The how is what our professional teachers and support staff and our administrators are going to be doing over the next number of months in our schools in order to implement that knowledge or implement those safety measures in the best way possible. We know how to teach. We know how to provide learning programs and stuff like this, but this is a new development for all of us and what's going to take teamwork in order to do it. It's been a monumental task and I thank everybody that's been involved in it and the work continues. We have the, we've been meeting and consulting with the education and health officials throughout the last week and the chief medical officer of health 
has provided clarity on a number of issues, which have been under consideration for some time. We appreciate her expertise and guidance on this matter. We also met with the Education Minister War and Health Minister Hagee last week to clarify uh, a few points. And we now have a solid plan for school reopening in September, a safe school reopening in September. And we are confident our administrators will be ready to implement it on a school by school basis. That said, if circumstance change, we've learned that over the last number of months, changes will have to happen and, the, and all the people involved in the team, the families, the province, the schools, will have to do what's necessary to do that. New information will also be reflected on our website, which in, includes a frequently asked questions section, which will be updated regularly as we move into the new school year. Communications is paramount in this on all parties. If there are concerns and worries out there, you have to reach out to your network, school, websites, whatever. Make sure you don't sit and worry, ask the questions so that we can get the answers for you. I want to remind everybody that the issues and concerns we are facing due to COVID-19 are coming across all Canada's jurisdiction around the world. It's not unique to us. But while the issues are much the same, the response may vary depending on the prevalence of COVID-19 within a community. And I think uh, Dr. Fitzgerald has articulated this clearly. Our prevalence is very low in this province because of the work that's been done to date. We want to keep it that way, but we also want to reap the reward of doing that work and providing a safe environment for our children to go back to school. We are fortunate, as I've said, that our peace remains very low in terms of uh, COVID numbers. We are, we are the envy, as I alluded to, of other jurisdictions. Our schools are safe. However, we will be implementing enhanced, enhanced health and safety and cleaning protocols to mitigate any risk of COVID spread. Should it emerge, details are in the detailed plan that you're gonna see shortly. In short, parents, students and staff should feel confident. And when schools open in September, protocols are in place to ensure school environments will remain safe. If the virus does reemerge to any significant degree, we'll ready, we're ready to pivot and adapt to what comes our way based on the advice and direction of the provincial government and public health authorities. Students and families must be ready to adapt as well because, because these are uncertain times and we do know exactly what the, we don't know exactly what the future is going to hold. We all must recognize and accept that things will not be exactly as they were before adjusting adjustments will be made. And some people may even be inconvenienced. The success of our return to in-class instruction will be largely dependent on the continued cooperation, commitment and compliance of those in our schools. Everybody has a part to play. We cannot make this work alone. We cannot complete this work alone. But if families work with the school administrators and school communities, we will make it you know, work together. The professionals in our system the support staff workers, the teachers, the administrators, I can guarantee are gonna do whatever they can to make this work for you within cooperation. And I really thank them for the effort and work they've done all the, over the last number of months. Thank you. I will now turn over the uh, floor to Dr. Fitzgerald. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Price, and uh, thank you to those uh, joining online today. It's a, a new experience, so um, new for me anyway. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today for the release of the English School District's Back to School Plan, a safe return to school. I'm also pleased for the role that public health officials have played in its development. The health and safety and well-being of our province has been paramount throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and the success that we've attained to date in keeping this virus contained in our communities is, is attributable to the public health measures in place and the public's unwavering commitment to following them. We've already shown what we can achieve by working together. And I'm confident that by continuing to do so, we can keep the number of new cases of COVID-19 in our province low and get our children back to school in a safe and supportive environment in which they can learn and thrive. With that in mind, today I'm announcing a new special measures order that will require the mandatory use of masks in indoor public spaces. 
Effective August 24th, wearing a non-medical mask that covers your nose and mouth will be mandatory for people five years of age and older while in public indoor settings, such as common areas of office buildings, riding public transit, shopping, attending places of worship, or a theater or performing arts venue. For a more detailed uh, list of public spaces where a mask will be required and some exemptions to this special measures orders, order, please visit gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19 um, for more information on our website. Uh, this information will be available later today. The mandatory use of non-medical masks is another important step to further protect our families and communities, as when worn properly, they can help to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Please remember though, that wearing a non-medical mask in the community is not a substitute for physical distancing and proper hand washing. Because of the low prevalence of COVID-19 currently in our province, the use of non-medical masks will not be required for children in K-12 while in the classroom. However, this will be closely monitored and could change based on any new developments in epidemiology or best available evidence. Some students may choose to wear a non-medical mask while in the classroom. And just as we have encouraged respect and kindness in all situations throughout this pandemic, the same rings true in the school setting. So please respect another's choice to wear a mask in the classroom. Non-medical masks are recommended in situations where a child cannot maintain physical distancing for extended periods of time to others outside of their class cohort. Masks will be required on school buses. However, no student will be required to wear one if they uh, do not tolerate it for some reason. Masks will also be required in communal areas for both students and staff in high school and for junior high students and staff if cohorts change classes. School staff will be required to wear masks when physical distancing is not achievable outside of their cohort, such as in staff rooms or break rooms. Teachers uh, and other staff who move between cohorts or instruct multiple cohorts, if they can't physically distance, they will be required to, to wear a mask. Anyone who's preparing or serving food to students will be required to wear a mask and in the office if physical distancing is not achievable and barriers such as plexiglass are not in place for office staff. Schools play a vital role in the community and in the development of our children and youth. They provide education to prepare young, children, young people for adulthood and rich learning and socialization opportunities to help shape them as individuals and contributing members of our society. Long-term school closures have potential to result in education gaps and other unfavorable consequences for students and families and pose additional hardships for children who live in poverty and those who rely on school-based counseling and other professional supports. Managing COVID-19 has always been about weighing potential risks and harms against the benefits of our actions. Right now in our province, we must consider that the harms posed to children by an ongoing absence from school outweigh the harms presented by COVID-19. The plan being presented here today was developed with the health and total well-being of students and staff top of mind to ensure the safe return to school. There will be changes in learning environments, but as much as possible, this plan provides a sense of normalcy for children while maintaining the ability to adapt to alternative methods of learning should we see a change in COVID-19 epidemiology in our province. Understandably, COVID-19 has instilled a sense of fear and ambiguity in many, and the return to school for teachers and students in September is certainly no exception. Please know that feelings of uncertainty and concern are normal during these extraordinary times, and that our public health officials remain committed in their efforts to help keep you and your families safe. If you or your child is experiencing feelings of anxiety or finding it difficult to cope, I would encourage you to visit, visit Bridge the Gap with two Ps, .ca, to access a wide range of locally available, confidential and free mental health and addictions programs for people of all ages. As I've said many times before, we are in this together and we will get through this together. While our public health system does its part and the education does their system does theirs, please continue to do yours. Stay home if you feel unwell. Keep your children home if they are unwell. Practice good cough and sneeze etiquette. Wash your hands often and well. Maintain a safe physical distance of two arms lengths from others while in public spaces and wear a non-medical mask when that is not possible. These measures remain our best defense against COVID-19. 
Model these behaviors for your children by showing them how and when to wash their hands, how to put on, wear, and safely remove a non-medical mask, what two meters looks like for physical distancing when they're out in the community, how to properly cover coughs and sneezes, and when to use hand sanitizer. Teaching your children these important prevention measures now at home will help ensure that they are more confident and better prepared when they return to school in the coming weeks. As you prepare at home, the public health and education officials will continue working hard to ensure that schools are prepared, supported, and safe when students and staff are welcomed back in September. We have all worked very hard to get to where we are today. And because of your efforts, children, teachers, and school staff can head back to school with a level of normal that they have not seen for six months. This is an incredible achievement, and we should all be proud. At the beginning of the pandemic, we came together and followed public health measures to protect our vulnerable populations and essential workers in healthcare, first response, the retail and transportation industries, and municipal services. We now have a responsibility to do our part to protect our children and essential school staff. And it will take our continued collective effort and adherence to public health measures in the community to do so. Like many turning points we have reached throughout this pandemic, the reopening of school is another significant milestone. One that brings us a step closer to regaining the normalcy and routine the families in our province have so dearly missed. We have come a long way, Newfoundland and Labrador, and together I'm confident we can go the distance. So thank you, and I'll now turn it back to you, Mr. Price. Oh, Gramway, your, your mic is muted there, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitzgerald. Uh, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Tony Stack, our CEO. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Granway. Um, and, and thank you, Cheryl, for hosting this. And special thanks as well to uh, Dr. Fitzgerald for joining us here today. To the media representatives on this call, I, I realize you've only had a short time to review this comprehensive document and its appendices, but I do encourage you to take the time to read all of it through. Uh, and, that, and that goes as well for the general public. We'll be posting this on our site. The plan is to reopen all schools under scenario one, as described in the provincial government's K-12 educational reentry plan, which I'm sure uh, many of you are familiar with by now. Scenario one is basically described as near normal with enhanced health and safety protocols in place. But near normal is not completely normal, and there are changes that will require school communities, students, and their families and staff to adapt to, I guess you could call it a new normal. Uh, the district plan is entitled a safe return to school, and that is obviously everyone's number one priority. The plan will reflect the direction and guidance provided through the provincial government's K-12 education reentry plan, which was released on July the 6th and from the latest advice from public health officials. Uh, we took the guidance and advice and we've devised a plan to operationalize it, to make it work at schools throughout all our regions. I wanna say up front that this is a living document. It will almost certainly be tweaked in the coming weeks as we near school opening, as we begin the school year. But this is where we are right now on this date with the low prevalence of COVID-19 in our province. Our primary purpose is to provide greater detail and amplification to school administrators to enable them to make site-specific arrangements for our more than 250 schools throughout every nook and cranny of this province. Obviously, arrangements made for school reentry at large urban school with say a thousand students will look very differently from a small school in a rural area. Every school is unique in this regard and must develop arrangements that work for their building and their students and staff. I'll take this opportunity to recognize the hard work and dedication of our school administrators. For many, this will be a complex undertaking as they ramp up for school reopening in September. You have my utmost confidence and respect. I also wanna thank the stakeholders involved in our lengthy consultation, uh, the Department of Education, Early Childhood Development, of course, and Health and Community Services representatives who we were engaged with right up until last evening. The NLTA and their special interest councils as well, representing teachers throughout the province, the Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of School Councils and the school council parent representatives that we met with in a series of meetings, uh, to our NAEP and, and QB representatives, and the more than 100 students who joined us virtually for a consultation session. 
They all provided valuable input and feedback in our plan and our continued planning moving forward. Meanwhile, school specific information will be provided to families from their school administrators as soon as available. We appreciate there is a short time frame to allow this information to be disseminated and to ensure all school staff are familiar with the protocols and their role in ensuring they are implemented. And that's, that's why administrators and staff are officially back at school a week in advance of students so that these school specific plans can be uh, developed and articulated to staff and families. There are, however, a number of overarching areas that we know will have impact on many students and families. And we want to get this plan out there to allow families the time to make any necessary arrangements. There are many operational considerations when we talk about the return to school in September. Too numerous to mention here in this venue, but these consider considerations are articulated and addressed in the plan and its appendices. And again, I encourage all to read it. Um, we also have developed a web page with frequently asked questions to drill down into some of the main issues and questions posed to us in the past weeks. I also encourage folks to read through that thoroughly. It will be updated with any new information we get between now and September uh, and on to the fall. I'm going to touch now on, on the main issues brought to our attention through our extensive consultations over the summer. First, we heard a lot about cleaning protocols. The district plan includes a section on enhanced cleaning protocols. We have hired additional custodial staff and we have adjusted duties to maximize hours spent on cleaning. And we are following all the expert advice in this regard. In order to ensure the safest, cleanest buildings possible, there will be no provision for community use of schools at this time, such as after hour adult recreational activities. The only exception would be uh, existing after-school childcare programs for students. There will also be no non-essential visitors permitted within schools. We know our schools are safe to open. Public health has advised that we are safe to open. We're determined to keep our school a safe environment so families can be confident in sending their children to school and we get down to the business of teaching and learning. Second area that we heard a lot about was masks. And Dr. Fitzgerald has uh, pointed out uh, all the protocols with respect to masks, they will not be required in classrooms themselves. They will be required on buses. They will be required in communal spaces. Uh, having said that, uh, as Dr. Fitzgerald alluded to, no child will be forced to wear a mask if, if, if it can be documented that they cannot tolerate it. The third area we heard from was busing. And um, right up from the outset, I have to acknowledge this will be a challenge. As health officials have said, they provide the advice and then we have to operationalize it. The medical advice provided to us is that there should be no more than two students to a seat on a school bus, and this includes younger children. So effectively, this means that a bus, which a uh, 72 passenger bus can now only carry 46 students. There are not enough available school buses to make up this, this disparity. Many buses already do double runs to pick up students, Consequently, we have calculated there will be uh, a possibility of over 6,000 students who would normally be eligible to ride the bus who would no longer be able to do so. That's amongst the 44,000 that we have ridership on an annual basis. So this, uh, this is a difficult decision. Basically, the 46 eligible riders who live the furthest from their zone school will have priority in available seating. Others, unfortunately, for now, will have to make their own transportation arrangements. Meanwhile, this also means all courtesy seating arrangements are suspended at this time, which in turn means there will be no need for any previously established courtesy stops within the 1.6 school bus eligibility zone. This does not apply to those students who qualify for alternate transportation. Their spaces are secure. Again, this was a, a very difficult decision to make in that we know this will impact negatively on many families. But on the other hand, it's not a difficult decision in the sense that we're following medical advice and student safety is paramount. The fourth area we heard about was uh, homeschooling. The provincial government legislation and the district policy allows for some homeschooling under certain circumstances. People can apply to homeschool and can either be approved or not approved based on their plan for meeting curriculum outcomes. However, parents should be very aware that this decision comes with certain realities. If you are homeschooling, 
it is you as a parent who will be responsible for providing qualified educational instruction to students. And homeschool homeschooling is typically a commitment that lasts an entire year. Um, right now, there are no option for virtual learning if you are homeschooling. And, and that's the case in, in, in normal circumstances. So if schools are open, teachers are providing in-class instruction to students in attendance. Fifth area was screening protocols. The plan includes a, sc a screening questionnaire, which is uh, updated since the release of the provincial government's education reentry plan. And it requires parents to go through the checklist list each morning to determine where their child should, whether or not their child should go to school. In short, if students are sick, they must stay home. If they arrive at school displaying signs of illness, they will be removed from class, taken to a designated health area or room, and a parent guardian will be required to pick them up and take them home. Uh, the plan includes a host of other areas where changes will be implemented, and they run the gamut from signage, directional arrows, hand sanitizers, personal protective equipment, as well as information around playground use, recess, food services, staff gatherings, physical distancing, sharing of equipment and resources, and, and a whole lot more. Again, we have captured most common questions in a frequently asked questions section on our website, and we have answered them with the information available to us at this time, some of which we, we just only received recently. As Director of Education, I recognize um, the only good news in all of this is that we are planning to have our children return to school under, as I say, near normal, new normal conditions. And that is possible because of the low prevalence of COVID-19 in our province. I also recognize that some of the measures being taken may be difficult to implement perfectly in every classroom at every moment of the day. But this is the reality of where we are in this extraordinary place and time. That said, the issues and concerns around a return to school are not unique to the Newfoundland Labrador and the school district. Since the beginning of the year, even before in-class instruction was suspended in March, I have been meeting with school district leaders from across the country and in other jurisdictions as well. Every jurisdiction has its own unique challenges. But one thing we have in common is our absolute commitment to the provision of safe educational environment for teaching and learning. Being mindful of the social and emotional impact this pandemic has had on our students and staff and the issues that will certainly arise as instruction resumes. There will be challenges. And frankly, not every issue will be addressed to everyone's satisfaction. So we would ask people to be patient, understanding, cooperative, and work with their school administrators to help ease the transition for students. It's been said a lot, but, but truly, we really are in this together. It's not going to be business as usual. It's not going to be a perfect plan for everyone. But fortunately, we have had and still have a very low presence of COVID-19 in the province. So we always had to remember that we are in an enviable position compared to many other jurisdictions. And I give Dr. Fitzgerald and her team, along with the provincial government, full credit for that. If we continue to put education and collective health and well-being of our students as our ultimate priority and approach this next challenge in a positive manner, I have every confidence we can allow children to feel safe and welcome in their schools within the parameters outlined for us. Finally, we know that issues will arise throughout this year. We know, as they say, that most plans don't survive first contact with reality. Again, for the reason we consider this plan to be a living document, there will no doubt be adjustments as the situation evolves. I know I am personally committed, our district staff is committed, and our board of trustees is committed to doing everything within our collective power to ensure schools are safe and welcoming to all students in September. I have every confidence in our dedicated administrators, creative teachers, and diligent support staff to do what they have always done, put student well-being and learning first. But we will need everybody's help, everybody in the province, to ensure it is successful. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our speakers here today. Um, as moderator, I will now move into the question and answer portion of today's event. For the benefit of our speakers, there are six reporters on the call today who will be asking questions. I will call on each reporter in the order that you registered for today's event. We will unmute your mic 
and then you will be able to engage and ask your questions. We ask that on each turn, you pose one question and one follow-up, and that's to uh, try and ensure a fair and equi equitable distribution for all our reporters. So we will begin um, today with Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Holly, you can unmute your mic. Hi, thanks for doing this. A uh, question about uh, masks in high school classes. Um, earlier in technical briefing, we talked about how um, cohorting isn't a reality just based on the curriculum and the students could be interacting with you know, up to 100 people in a day. So I'm wondering about kind of the logic behind uh, masks not being mandatory classes in high school. Hi, Holly. Um, so what our goal in all of this was to have kids go back to school in as normal a way as possible. Um, and so at the moment with our prevalence being where it is, we've made the decision that when children are in classes and they're seated and their chairs can be uh, distanced from each other by you know as much distance as possible, um, then uh, we think that they can sit safely without wearing a mask. But when they're up and on the move uh, and they you know, could be coming into closer contact with each other, uh, then they will have to wear a mask. So that was our reasoning behind that decision. Uh, obviously, as with anything, and as I've said many times, if the information we get changes, if the evidence changes, um, then we'll change. But that's where we're gonna start. Changes for I realize that you can't cohort at the high school level, but for the junior high and 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 uh, elementary school levels, what is the difference between a cohort and a class? So in in K to six, generally a cohort does equate to a class. They are together for their scheduling and just about every circumstance. There may be some uh, individual circumstances where that doesn't occur, and, and we're going to have to account for that. Uh, in seven to nine, again, generally the programming is students uh, are together for those those periods of instruction. Uh, if we can keep students from not moving and having teachers move, as an example, that would be a way of protecting the cohort. Uh, clearly, in high school, we're into a different uh, situation altogether. Uh, now, s smaller high schools may be able to cohort. Larger ones, that's a difficult challenge. You could have a class of students 
And at the end of that period, they could be going in, in five or six different directions to different periods of instruction. So um, the, the best we can do in those circumstances, again, when you're moving and mixing, uh, would be the mask wearing. In, inside of the classroom, if you're static and you're physically distanced uh, as much as possible, then, um, uh, but, but you're quite correct. Uh, cohorting is, is challenging in the 10 to 12 school. So, so in a larger school setting, um, say in an urban setting, um, where you know you already had classes of twenty-five students and up, where there wasn't necessarily a lot of space between desks and things like that, because we're not adding any modular classrooms or any extra spaces or anything like that. How are classes actually? Are they going to look any different than they did before we shut down? So they may. Uh, in answer to that question, Patrick. Um, depending on how the classroom is configured. I know a lot of classrooms for to facilitate teaching uh, would be in a in, in circular fashion, for example. But that may put them in, in close proximity. So we may have to go to a particular arrangement in the classroom that achieves the maximum physical distancing. Uh, so uh, yeah, they and, and as well, if we can relocate and match a larger class with a larger set of students, then you know, principals will have the uh, ability to do that, it, providing they have the, the flexible footprint in their building. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. We'll go now to uh, speak to Brian Madure with VOCM. Brian, your mic has been unmuted and you can unmute yourself, sir. Thanks. Just wondering, uh, I think it might be Ontario has a process to follow for parents who choose uh, not to send their children to school. They have a I think a deadline date that they have to uh, apply before that for an exemption. Is, is there any such process here if a parent decides that they wish not to send their child to school for, well, with safety concern, obviously? So right now, uh, the as alluded to, and you'll see it in the report, uh, and this is echoed from the provincial plan issued on July 6th, the only option is if a, a, a parent wishes to uh, apply for homeschooling. Okay. Uh, do I have a second question, Cheryl? You do, sir. Go go ahead with the follow up there. In uh, earlier on uh, in the uh, long term care homes, uh, moving workers in and out, uh, <clears throat> there were some restrictions put in place. They were confined to one home. Uh, any plans, say, for supply teachers? Uh, they tend to move around to various schools. Just confining them to one school, because if they do move around to several schools, you certainly increase risk. Uh, very good question, uh, Brian. And in fact, we are looking at uh, as, uh, substitute teachers. Uh, we're looking at data from previous years as to the substitute teacher usage. Uh, we're exploring options around that, um, that uh, will, will give us some ability to be flexible with respect to substitute teachers. Um, again, that's one of those things that will, will flow in, in, the, in the coming weeks. Um, and we're in, in discussions with the Department of Education and the Newfoundland Laboratory Teachers Association in that respect. Thank you, Brian. We are now moving to uh, Kellyanne Roberts with NTV News. Kellyanne, you can unmute your mic and engage with one question and one follow up. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stack, you had told teachers that they would see this plan uh, in advance. I'm hearing from many of them today that they found out at the same time of the public, they're going to be the ones implementing this. Um, why was this the case? Well, we're, we're into a space with uh, other agencies on this one. We're not completely alone in this space. Uh, and we're following um, protocols and fairness to the uh, other agencies involved here um, The uh, as well. Uh, you know, the previous versions did get into circulation and uh, that is, that's unfortunate. Um, you know, we would like to have things shared in draft in advance um, and we did it in a timely manner as possible. All right. Um, you mentioned physical distancing numerous times throughout the plan here, you know, essentially doing your best when you can't can, or maintain the two meters. Some classrooms have kids of 35 that sit two by two, I mean, physical distancing, obviously, when recommended, but what are we doing about oversized classrooms? So again, if, if we have situations like that, and, and those large classes, while they do exist, uh, it, it wouldn't be the norm, 
but there may be flexibility to relocate uh, or a class such as that in terms of how the school is programmed and scheduled. Uh, and that's something that we will support our administrators in doing and working through. Um, you know, clearly this is not, uh, as I say, it's not a, uh, it's a new normal. So we're going to have to have some innovative solutions there and we will physically distance to the best of our ability. Thanks, Gillian. We'll go next to David Murr with the telegram. David, your microphone is unmuted and you can uh, engage as necessary. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if there's any uh, at least early estimate of what all of these extra, extra measures um, will cost, uh, frankly. Is, is, is there any price tag that's associated with this plan? Uh, that would be a difficult to, to measure right now. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that we are not, uh, you know, we're going to be, obviously we have to be prudent with the public purse as in all cases. But if there is a health and safety requirement and we have to look at that, uh, then you know, we're going to act first and then figure it out later. Uh, and I know we, we have the, uh, the support of the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development in that endeavor. Um, thank you. Um, on the note of extra teachers and and, and substitutes, one, you know, I, I recall when the when this pandem pandemic first hit, there was kind of a, a call for you know medical practitioners of getting people out of retirement and maybe being able to help out um, in that regard. You know, has there been similar outreach um, out, uh, to, to the department or you know to to those people? You know, in the event that we do need teachers, you know, in case teachers get sick and all, you know, you know, in, in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. In fact. Uh... In certain jurisdictions in the province, certain areas, we've relied on, on retired teachers. So we have been in dialogue with the Department of Education, Early Childhood Development on that very issue. They're very supportive of a more robust engagement of retired teachers, should we have to go to that means. Uh, obviously, priority would be on available substitutes that we have. And if we have to go to retired teachers, then uh, that's an option. And we may look at a more robust presence of retired teachers. Thanks, David. Um, we will now go to Mark Quinn with CBC. Mark, I have unmuted you on my end. You can unmute yourself and engage as necessary with one question and one follow-up. Hello, yes, thank you. Mark Quinn with uh, CBC here. Um, I wondered, uh, Mr. Stack, if you could uh, go through the screening that will be done. If I understood correctly, uh, each student will be required to fill a form uh, daily for uh, screening, is that correct? So we're working through whether or not they had to fill the form. What we would like to do, like I think in an ideal scenario, you, a parent would have it, put it on your fridge, make sure you go through that checklist every day. Obviously, as we get into the routines, you're going to know what that checklist is. Uh, on the front end, initially, uh, it might be a good practice for parents to go through the exercise with their children. Um, and, and I'll defer to Dr. Fitzgerald uh, for any uh, amplification of that. That, you know, at this point, uh, it would be the expectation that uh, parents would go through this screening tool uh, on a daily basis uh, and staff as well uh, to ensure that they don't meet any of the criteria there uh, on the tool. And, and uh, if they don't, then it's safe to come to school. Mark, follow up. Yes, just as a follow. So if I understand you correctly, uh, they won't be required to... Uh, you know, physically bring in a form or to show uh, somehow that they've gone through the screening process. It's more of an expectation uh, that you would hope each student would do every day as well as teachers. That's correct. Uh, now, there may be some utility in uh, on the first go around in the early days of actually doing a form, uh, but that, that gets complex. You know, you've got schools with 600 students coming in with pieces of paper. Uh, it's, always a, it's always a challenge. Uh, we really want and need our parent community, um, our school staffs, to understand the, the vital importance of completing that document um, in the home setting before they attend school and um, encourage them to go through that form. Now, whether or not it actually has to be filled out and processed, uh, that's something we'll be discussing with our, our school administrators. Thank you. I would reiterate that, um, you know, it's in nobody's interest to uh, go through this and uh, to, through the form and, and to uh, 
uh, to not be forthcoming about uh, about any risk factors that may be there. So, uh, you know, we all have a responsibility to keep our schools safe. Um, and this is a big, big part of that, is completing that screening form. Thank you, Mark. As we've now gone through one round of questions, I will begin again at the beginning uh, and we will um, head back to, oh, uh, actually, okay. Uh, Heather Gillis with CBC. Heather, my apologies there. I will, uh, I, I do recognize you have a, a question and I will open it up and you go right ahead. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, what will happen for students who get sick? I know you said that there's a health room and the student will go to that designated health room and then their parents will have to pick them up immediately. Uh, but what happens to the rest of the class if a student is positive in order to prevent an outbreak? Okay, so there's a couple of different things here. Not every kid who gets sick in school is going to be positive, right? So we have to remember that. Um, so just because a child gets sick and has to go home doesn't mean that, um, you know, anything is going to have to happen in that classroom. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is if we do have a child who tests positive for COVID-19, then there will be protocols in place for public health to do contact tracing. So any children who are identified as a close contact of uh, that case will be uh, notified and then those people will have to self-isolate uh, and, and testing will be recommended for those people as well. Um, how that translates exactly into every classroom, obviously that's not something you can broadly um, broadly make a statement about. It's going to be a very um, contextualized thing, but um, for the most part, um, you know, if we have a child in a classroom, in a cohort of classroom, uh, who, who does test positive, uh, then the children in that classroom will be tested and, and quarantined. So just to follow up, um, a kid is positive in a class in that cohort, would that mean all of those kids are not in school for the next two weeks? What will happen then? Will they learn online? Can someone explain that piece? Sorry, can you repeat that question again? So if we have a child who's positive in a class and um, the rest of the class has to isolate for two weeks, what happens with that class? Will they learn online or that cohort? We'll, we'll have to address that situation as it presents itself. Obviously, the continuity of learning for those children will be very important. Um, you know, if, if that becomes a, a protracted issue requiring additional resources, then we have some flexibility to do that. And of course, we have uh, we can reach back through the Department of Education, Early Childhood Development as well. Thank you, Heather. And I, I will add you as well to the list. Um, if there's any other reporters who are on uh, on the call who I have missed, you want, might want to just raise your hand and bring yourself to my attention and I'll round back to you. Um, we will go back through the list now of, uh, of the reporters in the order that they registered for uh, today's news conference and allow um, Holly McKenzie Souter. Uh, Holly, I have unmuted you on my end, I do believe, and you can go right ahead. Hi, I'm wondering if you could talk a little about um, kind of the trauma-informed training that teachers are going to go through and also, um, further to that, kind of the, the cohorting question of kind of how students' social relationships with each other and their friends will kind of play into how cohorts are planned or, or kind of what kind of mingling is allowed when at school. So in reference to your first uh, question regarding to trauma informed practice, that, that will be part of the professional learning that uh, teachers and school staffs will go through in the um, in the week prior to the return of, of students uh, clearly um, you know uh, it is a, a, a deep subject that has to be embraced we are really cognizant of the societal angst that has occurred uh, in, in some respects the entire world has gone through a shared trauma and, and um, education and learning uh, cannot happen until we do we address those issues early on? We'll go through the year very slow and, and uh, be cognizant of social emotional learning, uh, trauma informed practice uh, with our staff and our students. And 
it, it'll it'll be key to setting the environment conducive to learning, uh, given what uh, everyone has been through. Um, and there's been subsets of that, individual experiences that are different, and we had to be cognizant of that as well. Um, I could ask another panelist, um, Ms. Georgina Lake, to elaborate on the exact details of the trauma-informed uh, practice plan. Uh, Georgina, if, if you will. Might need to, there we go, go right ahead. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon now. Um, thanks. The trauma-informed practice uh, professional learning opportunity will provide educators with an opportunity to, to um, learn uh, more about um, the types of learning environments that enhance learning when people have experienced trauma. So we know for sure that students benefit in learning environments that are calm, predictable, and supportive. So when we think about any prolonged stress uh, that have been caused by being away from school so long, then we know that students are going to be at risk to have struggles learning with their behavior, forming friendships. So the trauma-informed practice PL will provide an opportunity in conjunction with social and emotional learning and comprehensive school health for teachers to consider our roles and what we can do to create optimal learning environments for all students. And I, I, I don't know if you need to re, uh, re, repeat your second part of your question regarding cohorts. Yeah, I'm just wondering about kind of how um, cohorts will take into account kind of social needs of students who um, may want to be around their friends or, um, yeah, I guess how will help, you know, students support each other while, while they're in school. So uh, a cohort in a K to six environment is essentially the homeroom class. Now there could be sub cohorts within there, depending on how the class is configured. You might want to have, for example, to limit it, uh, interaction. You could have a group of four or six that are in one part of the classroom and four or six in another part of the classroom. Uh, in a sort of a sub cohort, if we can call it that, to limit interaction depending on the activity. Uh, and they stay together for, for most activities. That'll be up to the, the individual school and classroom teacher. Um, but a cohort in K to nine is really defined as, as the homeroom class. Um, so just like every other year, students are grouped in homerooms and, and uh, our school staffs are well accustomed to grouping those students in accordance with uh, multiple factors around around uh, designing learning and, and grouping kids together. Thank you. We now go to Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Patrick, your mic is unmuted for one question, one follow-up. Uh, hi, I want to ask a question about ventilation in schools. Can you talk about some of the um, new things you're doing to, uh, to, to make sure that schools are better ventilated? Okay, in brief, you know, it, uh, it's the na <laughs> it's natural ventilation policy is, is very simply opening windows uh, and opening them uh, to the degree possible. Um, the, uh, there are some other settings on HVAC uh, within our schools that have HVAC, or many do not, uh, that can be um, increased to allow for more ventilation. Uh, and I'm going to defer to another panelist, Terry Hall, if he wants to elaborate on that. Thank you, Tony. Um, no, and uh, short and sweet is exactly what you said. Uh, opening windows uh, pre uh, when class starts, during uh, breaks, lunch, recess during the day, um, you know, uh, to the required amount and the door allows fresh air to flow through. Um, even in times when there might be some inclement weather, um, we have uh, had great success in even opening a window even an inch uh, and leaving it there so there's no interruption to class or no way they're getting in has proven very effective. And, and this policy has been around a long, long time uh, because, you know, a lot of our school structures uh, doesn't have the mechanical ventilation. So that's, that's pretty much it, Tony. Thanks. So, so is this just an existing policy that's continuing and, and is what happens in the winter when it gets cold? 
So this, this policy has been around a long while. We will uh, re-emphasize to our schools, uh, given the nature of what we're dealing with, uh, with now in order to keep uh, as much fresh air as possible. Um, again, in the winter, uh, it's, it's not always possible, but even at certain times during the day, as I said, in the policy, it's even pre-classes starting for 15 minutes uh, and during lunch period, even if you can open for a while. And like I said, even, even an inch has proven uh, uh, to be extremely effective, so it doesn't allow any weather in. And in the absence of even being able to open a window, um, you know, even just opening the door itself allows certain air to come in and out and, and flow so it doesn't get stagnant in the classroom uh, itself. Thanks, folks. Uh, and thank you, Patrick. We go now to Brian Medora with VOCM. Brian, your mic has been unmuted. Go ahead with one question, one follow-up. Just further on the school buses, uh, we're getting a lot of reaction on that uh, from places where it's pretty dangerous to walk the roads. We heard in the briefing that whatever you had to purchase, masks, cleaning equipment, etc., would be done uh, regardless of cost. Just wondering, on school buses, have you or, or do you plan to try to acquire extra buses, or do extra runs to meet the demand, those 6,000 kids? Uh, short answer to that is uh, yes, Brian. We'll look at that, but in this at this juncture, in fact, you know, just the uh, the supply chain for the acquisition of buses um, is a challenge. Our contractors uh, are, are limited in in what they have available. Uh, if there are buses, extra transportation resources out there, we'll certainly ex explore that. But but we want to be realistic and not. Uh, not increase expectation that this is a, a solution that can be applied everywhere. Uh, there is not only uh, difficulty in sourcing additional student transportation resources in the form of the vehicles, also the personnel uh, recruiting drivers um, is, is, a, is a challenge. Um, and that is part of this. So I wouldn't want to create an unrealistic expectation that we could resolve it that way. We'll do what we can and what's available. Um, and we will be, you know, uh, buses are acquired through a process involving all of the other Atlantic provinces. And, um, you know, we, we will do what we can to leverage that, uh, that buying power and, and talk to the province about a best approach. Um, and, and again, uh, Terry Hall, Chief Financial Officer, has student transportation under his wing. And Terry, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, that's good, Tony. You, you've covered it. Thank you. And further to the, uh, uh, with the board's buses, it's fairly straightforward, but uh, the private contracted out buses, uh, who does the disinfecting? What What is expected of them? And how would you police or enforce or whatever uh, to make sure that it is being done? So the, the expectation is laid out uh, both for contracted and board owned buses. And uh, we expect our contractors to adhere, just like a, um, any vendor in this province uh, has to adjust their operating practice right now. If you're a store owner or any other business owner, you've had to adapt to, uh, to the new normal again. And, uh, and, and that's going to be required. Uh, it's absolutely um, essential to doing what we can to, for around hygiene and sanitation. And it's a requirement. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Brian. Um, just need to find her in my list here now, and I will uh, make uh, or unmute Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Kellyanne, uh, your mic is unmuted. Thank you. Um, wondering what's going to be done for paid leave for employers that have to stay home if they experience the COVID-19 symptoms. So um, we are uh, compliant with uh, the provincial guideline uh, with respect to that. And uh, if someone uh, has to, if, if someone has to isolate uh, a staff member um, uh, as per an order, and um, then there's provisions for that for paid leave. However, if an employee is, uh, is sick with COVID, then, then that is uh, under the current policy, uh, sick leave. 
All right, thank you. And um, wondering, if the, uh, similar for substitutes, I, I believe this was touched on the beginning, but I may have missed it. Um, are substitute teachers able to go to different schools in a single day, or are they only to do one school per day? Uh, right now in this plan, we haven't uh, delineated that. Uh, it's uh, the whole issue of substitute teachers. We are looking at it deeper. Uh, there may be uh, ability, as I said before, where we can, based on previous historical usage of substitutes, actually assign them and group them with particular schools uh, to to minimize the interaction. Um, but uh, in terms of just like itinerant staff, if they if virtual can be accomplished for itinerant staff, we'll, we'll encourage that. But in the case of substitutes, then it, it falls down to the other protective measures such as the physical distancing, the mask wearing, uh, and, and the appropriate uh, PPE. Great, thank you very much, Kellyanne. Um, and now we do a transition to David Marr with the Telegram. David, go right ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if you can, uh, are there any specific kind of caveats for you know teachers and staff who either themselves are immunocompromised or maybe have immunocompromised uh, you know family members or loved ones at home? Are there any specific measures uh, there to support those those people? So we would employ our normal uh, accommodation protocols and policies with respect to that. Uh, there's a medical piece to that. There's a human resource piece to that. And we will go through each case on a case-by-case uh, -case basis. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, uh, extracurricular uh, um, activities. Um, you know, how will they be allowed to, to go forward? I think specifically of choir, as you know, there's kind of a famous example of a, of a, of a super, super spreader event uh, related to a choir practice. Um, you know, how will those be able to, uh, to take place safely? So uh, I want to differentiate between uh, choir that is extracurricular and choir that is part of our curricular program. So in the document, uh, and, and we had a great dialogue with our special interest council, uh, the NLTA, uh, special interest council for music and, and art education. And in, in those uh, forms, and they've done a, an excellent uh, document there that speaks to that. Uh, if it's part of the curriculum, then of course, music classes will go as they always did, albeit uh, following the, the, the advice of the chief medical officer of health. There are things that can be done virtually. There are certain instruments that would be preferred to be played instead of, uh, you know, those that uh, would produce, um, I guess, I'm looking for the appropriate medical term, but saliva in the atmosphere. Uh, and um, the uh, so I, I'll distinguish that the curricular pieces go ahead. The uh, there may be the ability if you can achieve the, uh, the parameters of the chief medical officer's advice, where things like that can proceed in an extracurricular manner, but, uh, you know, that would be during lunch or before, before school starts. Uh, after school, we need that time for cleaning. That's the main reason why we're limiting the indoor extracurricular activities. Uh, our total focus of our custodial staff has to be on doing that uh, deep clean requirements that are outlined in the report. Uh, and that's the reason that uh, you know, initially we're staying, going to stay away from indoor extracurricular activities. Outdoor extracurricular activities, in accordance with the Chief Medical Officer's guidelines and in accordance with the sport governing body's policies, uh, can proceed. Folks, just to let us all be aware, we're, we're winding down time here now, so I do believe this is going to be the, the last uh, two individuals who will be asking questions. So um, I will now unmute and allow Mark Quinn with CBC to address the panel. Mark, please go ahead. One question, one follow-up. Uh, yes, I'll just have one question. Um, regarding extracurricular activities, uh, if I understood correctly, some extracurricular activities will be done during lunch but the school district is advising parents, or sorry, advising against choir and wind instruments. I wonder if you could talk about why uh, those two things, choir and wind instruments, um, are being advised against. Uh, I think that's... Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think we can, uh, uh, I can take that one. Um, so, 
There is um, some concern, uh, certainly with regard to uh, both uh, singing and with playing wind, wind instruments, that there is an increased risk of uh, um, of spread of uh, virus, right, through droplets. So we know that when we sing, when we um, play certain instruments, there may be, uh, and we, we produce more force behind that, uh, and so we may be able to spread those particles further in the air. And so um, there's some, uh, there's not a lot of evidence out there that's looking at this right now, and, and so we have erred on the side of caution, I guess, um, to, to make that recommendation. We are still looking at it. There is still some, um, some research going on. Um, so those recommendations may change as time goes on, depending on what the evidence tells us. Uh, but we do know that we have had, uh, there have been significant outbreaks in areas where um, people have, uh, you know, where there has been singing. Um, there's, there's not definitive evidence that the singing is what caused it, but, you know, we're trying to, um, trying to be as careful as we can um, to start uh, with the school year. So, um, you know, if the evidence changes, again, we'll change, as I've said many times before. Mark, did you have a follow-up to that? Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right. And with that, we have one other individual. So, um, Heather, I do believe uh, Heather Gillis with CBC. I have unmuted you, and I do believe you can interact now as needed. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, what number of extra custodians has the school district hired? And can you explain what the cleaning protocols for them is going to look like over the school year? So everything is outlined in the report. Um, we're following and had a, a lengthy uh, dialogue, uh, exchange of information with the uh, health and community services around the appropriate cleaning protocols. Uh, our custodial staff have been trained in that. Recently, we held a job fair as an example. Uh, we've got uh, somewhere between 70 and 100 uh, hired or in the hiring process uh, as additional casual workers. We're prepared to deploy those as required um, to meet uh, high uh, intensity needs. Um, and, you know, should we have to go and, and do further recruiting? Uh, then we will. Uh, but right now, that's that's where we are. Uh, Terry, I don't know if you had the, again, another thing under his wing is the uh, facilities. Uh, if you had anything to add to that. Um, no, that's a great summary, Tony. And as you said, the protocols are documented in, in the report to read. Um, I, I guess the high points are definitely increased cleaning of all high touch areas throughout the day. Uh, while, school, while school is even on, um, and uh, cleaning and disinfecting uh, every night, uh, obviously before the next day starts, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know we limited access to the school after hours because we want to maintain the time that we can in order to keep schools as clean as possible. Are there any follow up to that? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Um, all right, folks. Well, that concludes our event for today. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, complete information is available, as always, from the district's NLESD website and our Twitter feed. Updated information as needed will be added to the dedicated web page for September reopening plans for 2020. We look forward to getting everybody back together and creating our new and safe learning spaces together. Thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, for doing that piece. Thank you to uh, people across the province that have tuned in, and thank you to the media for this. It's gonna take everybody involved to make sure this is successful. I will guarantee that there'll be some surprises between now and September, but what I will say from the Board of Trustees point of view, is that uh, all levels of government to the highest level, even in the new environment, are engaged. Our school administrators are engaged and whatever it takes to get it done properly will be done. Thank you. Thanks everyone.